And the Fed doesn't want to go through that because they get paid on debt. So they don't want to see the debt disappear. They lose their They're their trying payday. to avoid the inevitable? Yes. Through inflation. Yes. And so that's why you see Bernanke and the Fed coming out and saying, here's another trillion dollars in quantitative easing one, and we're going to paper over all of these bad debts and give it to the bank so they can pay off the bad loans and whatever, and quantitative easing too. And, uh, you know, so we have two issues, the deflation issue, uh, which is not very palatable to people in power, and the only other option out there is to print the money to pay this off, which is the inflationary route, which is typically what happens throughout history because it's a much more passive, um, less visible mm -hmm. It's event. a hidden tax, essentially. It's a hidden tax, and, and, it's, and, it's, uh, and it's much easier on, on, on people in political power because it's, uh, you know, uh, the population doesn't quite feel it. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is when you've passed this point of no return with all of these issues and you keep printing more money, that leads to uh, an event called hyperinflation. And that essentially means that so much money has been printed that prices rise so, so fast that it just completely destroys the value of the currency. And so we're dealing with two issues right now. We're dealing with deflation in the housing bubble. You've seen housing prices still decline because uh, anything that has to do with credit or loans is deflating. People are defaulting. That market's deflating. Yet you see uh, prices of food year over year for the year of essentially all of the year 2010, corn, cotton, commodities, commodities, whatever, is up 46% in 12 months. And this is very uh, easy to find information on the web. And a lot of this has actually come through um, price scans at grocery stores and Walmart because the government doesn't report the real inflation numbers. They took out all, they took out food and oil and gasoline out of the actual measurement so that it looks better, right? So same with just, unemployment. <laughs> same with unemployment. So they're, they're completely useless. So if you go by the prices that you see at the store in Starbucks and coffee and, and juice and milk at Walmart, on average, food prices have gone up 46% in the last 12 months. And a lot of the, the vendors out there, instead of raising the prices significantly, they've reduced the quantity size. So instead of getting a 16-ounce bag of chips, you're now getting a 12-ounce, and you just don't even know it, but mm -hmm. you're paying the same amount of price. Right. So there's where the 30% the comes from, right? Um, so inflation has started to, to come into the system through this. They're having huge issues in China in the real estate market right there with inflation and real estate that they're trying to, to get under hold. And so the end game for all of this uh, through the people who I've studied for the last few years now and who really, really know this stuff is hyperinflation. And there's going to come a point in time where no matter how much money you have in U.S. dollars, it's not going to buy you anything. And like I said, if you think that's far-fetched conspiracy theory, you know, I'm talking crazy stuff, it's 30 different countries in the last 100 years. I think about Germany. Germany in the 1930s. Um, uh, you know, the last, it's already happened here in the U.S. twice. People just don't know about it. It happened to the U.S. Re you know, revolution, um, the Civil War. Already went through hyperinflation here twice. Um, and uh, the last time was in Argentina in 1980. It was one of the most recent times. And it's a very civil, civilized country. Um, and one day people woke up and the banks were shut down. They couldn't take their money out. Uh, the government devalued the currency by, I think, like a factor of 50% to 100%. So... You woke up the next morning, you couldn't get your money out of the bank account, and the government said it's now worth half of what it was the day before, which means your house and your car and everything and food cost twice as much, and all of the money you had saved up for retirement uh, now bought you half of what it normally would have. Um, and the problem with this is all of the people in the boomer generation who are dependent upon Social Security and that check to keep paying their rent, which is the vast majority of people in that age group category, unfortunately, um, you know, let's say you get a check for $1,000 a month and your house is paid off and whatever that may be. So it's just enough to buy food and pay for a prescription medication and whatever else you need. Well, it's not going to really matter much when a gallon of milk is 20 bucks, you know, or your groceries, instead of costing you $50 a week, cost $500 a week because the amount of money that you get in that check is still going to be $1,000 every month. The amount of money that you have in your savings account or your portfolio, investment portfolio, is going to stay the same, but the value of it is going to have dropped like a rock. So it's going to buy you 10% of what it would have normally bought you today. And that's the real issue, is if you have money in your bank account and it's in U.S. dollars, 
my personal feeling and the feeling of many others uh, who follow this and who've studied this is that in the next six to 36 months, uh, it's not going to be worth anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the opportunity here, and that's why I said you're either going to end up on the losing side and you're going to lose everything, or you're going to end up on the winning side because there's a, an alternative play to take advantage of that, which is to get into commodities and gold and silver, and you're going to come out of that uh, on a hugely winning side. And I'll give you a quick, a quick number in 1980. So last time we went through a big bout of inflation was in 1980. And if you had bought $20,000 in silver... Um, can't spell, in 1971, and then you had kept it, so you bought 20K in silver, $20,000 in silver in 1971. By 1980, that amount of silver, 20 grand worth, would have been 700, worth $770,000, and that's in nine years. Uh, at the same time, the value of your house dropped like a rock. So if you had invested in real estate during, in 1971, in, in 1980, it didn't drop like a rock. I think it, it actually went up by twofold. But it dropped in a rock when valued against silver, which jumped up several thousand, I believe like 3,500% uh, during that same time period. And so the deal with 1980 was is we didn't have all five of those issues. We really just had one, which was inflation. And the other interesting part is that it really wasn't a global issue. Uh, we didn't have Ireland and Portugal and Spain Greece. and Greece going under, <laughs> right? And also, people in China couldn't buy gold. People in Russia couldn't buy gold. Uh, many, many countries around the world couldn't buy gold and silver at the time. So there was a lot of buyers for a given pile of material. Well, now there's how many billion Chinese who can come 1. in and who are billion. buying gold like crazy right now and everybody else around the world that's really uh, globally available at this point, yet the amount of money, of it, the amount of physical gold and silver that's above the earth is relatively unchanged and in many cases mm -hmm. it's much less. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of result is going to be possible very shortly here over the next couple of years, but it's probably going to be a factor of 10.